Aha, I think we are live. Ah, okay. Oh, forgot to switch it back. That should be good. Yeah, not bad. Welcome everyone, or all one person. So we're gonna draw the human head. Just got my pencils sharpened up, ready to go. Although I'm gonna use one was already sharpened. Oh, that's Luis. Welcome, Luis. I hope you're doing well. Okay, so we're going to do a head drawing. I chose a pose that's kind of challenging, to be honest. It has tough lighting. It's kind of a tough angle. And she's like looking up a little bit. It's not, not an easy pose. I don't know why I chose it. I was up for a challenge, I guess. Hopefully it goes well. And uh, we will find out shortly. So we're going to start with the big shape of the head and then typically follow, you know, our, our usual pattern, which is working from big shapes down to smaller shapes and working our way down piece by piece until we get into, you know, individual features and, and that kind of thing. So we want to start with the big shape of the head. So we're going to have the cranial mass first. She's going to be pretty round, pretty circular, I think, for the most part. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to start with like a circle. It could be a little bit of an oval from this angle, but it's, it's hard to tell with all her hair up there. I think a circle should work okay. Some people have rounder cranial masses than others. You know, some people have slightly more oval type cranial masses, some more circular. It really just depends on the person. And that's part of what you have to learn as an artist, right? Is you have to learn to like kind of observe who you want to draw. Or if you're inventing a head, you have to literally think about like, okay, what type of head do I want to draw? Does this person have a long cranial mass, short cranial mass, more circular, more oval, a long head, short head? I mean, there's just so many options. But I'm kind of starting with a circle. And we're going to pull the side plane of the head over this way. Somewhere right around there. And then we'll see if we can find how the jaw is going to link around here and connect uh, you know, down to like kind of where the chin is. And her jaw, she has kind of a wide jaw shape. It's always tough to capture, but I'm just gonna start with kind of like a generic shape here, kind of like this, <clears throat> right? And then the chin is gonna be sitting kind of like down in here somewhere, right about there. So that's an okay shape to start with. You know, and these head shapes are really tough to draw. I, I, it looks easy when you watch someone do it that's been doing it for a long time, but the truth is they are very challenging. There's nothing easy about them. Uh, it took me, you know, a few years at least to get to the point where I could just kind of draw a nice head shape that's exactly the way I want it to work. And it's, it's tough, I don't know. They take a lot of practice, I guess is my point. And uh, yeah, but that's kind of what we end up with. So let's see if we can find our next set. Also, you notice I marked kind of where the back of the jaw and the front of the ear are gonna sit, but it's kind of early to put the ear on there, right? This might change. 
right? So if I were to add the ear on there right now, we'd have to keep in mind like, wait a minute, that might change too. So it's probably too early for that. But next we need the center line, right? Which is gonna come up from the chin roughly and sit at an angle because her head has a tilt to it. You know, so we have to determine what is that tilt and that angle. And I'm gonna do that just by taking my best guess initially. Kind of using my pencil, compare it to the reference. And that's not, not bad. May have angled it a little bit too much. Maybe not, I don't know. It's close. Maybe angle it a tiny bit less, but I, I think it's pretty close. So our center line is gonna be right about there. Hairline, it sits right up at the change in plane of the forehead, right? So if we have, you know, top of the head up here, side here, that change in plane of the forehead's happening kind of right in through here. Depending on the person, it might sit more, you know, the hairline might sit more up at the top of that change in plane, or it might be more like right on it. Again, you just have to observe and figure out like, okay, is this, you know, how does this person's head work? In this case, it sits pretty low, kind of near where that change in plane sits. Kind of like down here. You know, so that leaves us the shape of the face right here. And that's not bad, right? So we have the hairline, the chin. The next thing we need to do is divide this space into thirds, right? And that'll help us find the brow line, the nose line, and the chin. Question is, is this a good shape for the face? So before we do that, we could add just real quick, a little bit of the hairline. Right, just to separate out the face a little bit more and to figure out if that shape is really working properly. And is it working properly with the ear? Is it working? You know, our hair is kind of sitting here. I think we can shift this. Oh, I dropped my eraser. Dang. Oh, nope, didn't go very far. That's good. Okay. Right, so maybe we can shift this forward a little bit. I think that works a little bit better. This is okay. This feels a little bit tall to me, right? This shape that we have here for the face. So then the question is, what do we do about that? I mean, the obvious answer is that we move the hairline down, but that kind of aligns where it needs to be up here. So it could be that we need to move the jaw up a little bit. You know, maybe the jaw needs to sit a little bit higher. Feels a little bit better. You know, so just trying to evaluate what's going on here. I think that's a pretty good starting position, right? So from here now we can break this space into thirds and just look for nice even thirds. I mean, her, her face usually fits those thirds pretty well and her head's, there's not much of an up or down tilt. It's mostly side tilt and looking away from us. So I'm pretty sure if I leaned over here right now and kind of measured on the reference, I feel like those thirds would work really well. Yeah, they do. They work about perfectly. Okay, so let's figure out if this is right. Boom. Boom. Eh, not quite. Pull this one down just a little bit. This one down just a little bit more. It's pretty close. close enough that I think it'll work. You know, uh, we can kind of find where the side plane of the head sits at this point, which is sort of like over here, right? So like the side plane of her head now, 
It was like kind of like way over here. You know, so then we need to figure out what do we do next, right? We can start breaking the face down a little bit more, looking for the glabella, which kind of comes in this way, just ever so slightly, and then down this direction. Right, and then look for the inside of this eye socket. Kind of help judge that angle a little bit. And then we need to get the shape of the brow <clears throat> as it relates kind of from side to side. So her brow shape uh, is very angled over here, right? So it's going to sit at a pretty extreme angle and then kind of roughly match up over to this side. A little bit like that, maybe. This, we're just using a quick <clears throat> rhythm to try and get the uh, both halves of the brow to align. But to be honest, we're not seeing much of the brow on this side. So I don't know how important that really is. Uh, from here, this is going to kind of move down this way a little bit. So cut in. Down across here, right? And we're looking for that eye socket shape. Just sit roughly somewhere about there. You know, on this side, we have her forehead. Kind of dropping down this way. Up this way. in that direction, right? And then it's going to meet up with the cheekbone down here, but we have to figure out how far does this go, right? And assuming this is relatively correct, I think it's going to kind of line up right across there. Bone should come out kind of that direction. And then we need the sweep of the nose as well. So before I do too much of this eye socket, I'm going to go in there and look for the sweep of the nose real quick. Just the general direction of the nose because I want to make sure that's working properly. All right, kind of comes down this way, out a little bit. down and then kind of connecting back over this way. Not bad. All right, maybe we can find this nostril real quick up in here. sitting about like that. Uh, now that this, once we get this established, we can start to figure out how much of this we should be seeing over here. It's not bad. I think it's relatively correct. So then from there we can kind of swing the cheek down this direction, right? And then the chin kind of pops out let's see directly under this nostril. So that seems about right. Chin's going to sit right about there. You know, this eye socket kind of 
come in this way, and it basically sits down in there. Now, the her brow shape, it's not totally flat right here. It actually goes up kind of this direction, and then up this direction. Right, so it's kind of like that. Also, just so you guys know, I can't read the questions from where I'm sitting. And Olivia's eating some food, so she'll be back to reading questions in a minute. Kind of a jaw shape on there. Okay, so now that we've got this mostly established, we can kind of place the ear at this point, right? I think we should be able to do that pretty confidently. The bottom of the ear sits roughly even with the top of the nostril. Which means this ear is probably gonna sit right about here. All right, let's see if we can get rid of Construction lines. Forehead. A little bit of the forehead right there. I will say, and my what I'm seeing here, right along here compared to the reference, is that the forehead on mine is a little bit long. I'm not entirely sure why that is. Oh, yeah, I am. Now I am sure, it's because it is a little bit tall. Maybe we can bring it down a little bit. I think that's pretty good. All right, so from there we can find um, the thirds for the mouth. Hi. I have a question to read you. Okay. This is from Brickman, who's back ah, again. Brickman, welcome back. Welcome back, Brickman. Uh, so Brickman asks, hi, Brian. What do you think the reason is, what do you think is the reason for some artists to start shading in light areas, it seems strange to me. Um, I don't know. I'm sure part of that just has to do with how you learn. I mean, to me, it makes it tough to judge the lighter values without having like the darker values to judge them against. And usually what you'll see is people tend to make things too dark or too light. But I think part of where that comes from is working with watercolor, maybe. Because I know watercolor works the opposite way, where you work from like lights to darks, as opposed to like putting your darks and then your lights. So maybe they started out with that. But I don't know. I mean, I personally, that's not how I learned. So I can't, I can't tell you exactly why they're doing it. Other than if I had a student that was doing that, I would tell them to not do it. But I don't know. I can't say for certain that it's like totally wrong. I don't know. It just doesn't seem like the best approach. But again, that could just be because that's all I know. Put a little bit of the neck on here. And there's also, I don't know, there's a number of artists I've seen work that way. So, I mean, it can work. I think, I think as long as you I don't know, learn like a, a specific way and kind of stick to it, eventually your brain will adapt and you'll just be able to do it. Wasn't it the, the kind of like Watts philosophy and that they teach there and, you know, that whole line of thinking is more like you establish your, I don't know, like uh, lights and dark area to sort of calibrate the drawing? Yeah. 
And then, I can't, tell me if I'm wrong, but if, I feel like you're supposed to put in your darkest dark pretty soon in the yeah. process so that you know what the darkest dark is going to be and that way you like kind of have your whole value. Yeah, really I mean, it's really difficult to judge value when you don't have a full value range established. So, I mean, that's kind of the idea is you want to establish that like middle like shadow value or whatever the lightest shadow value is and then go for that darkest dark and then that'll kind of give you that full range to judge everything else against is the idea. Yeah. But I, from what I've seen, most of the people that work in a way where they're starting with the lights, they're usually people that are very advanced and have been doing this for a long time. And once you've done this long enough and you kind of know what the end result is and you've done it a bunch of times, you've drawn like a million heads. At that point, it doesn't really matter what approach you take, to be honest. Like you can... You know, like I've seen artists that are like, well, I just start with the eye and I work my way out and then we have this whole head and everything works perfectly. I mean, if you've been doing this for like 20 years and you've drawn a million heads and your ability to judge proportion and distance and, and line everything up in your head works really well, yeah, totally you can do that. It's not like you have to follow all these steps every time. These steps are more for like learning purposes. You know, this is like how you learn to draw. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just depends. I mean, there's, I'm not going to knock it too hard because I know there's good artists that I've seen work that way. But like I was saying, they're also usually pretty advanced people. And I don't know necessarily that they learned that way. But maybe they did. I, I really don't know. Okay, break this bottom third into thirds, which is pretty close. This one up just a little bit. That seems pretty good. All right, tooth cylinder kind of projects forward a little bit. Around this way. Same thing like this, right? Like what I'm doing right now is something that's more for teaching and learning. Right? Like you have to understand how the tooth cylinder works and how it sort of pushes forward from the rest of the face. But like if I was just drawing my own drawing, I was, you know, I wasn't teaching anybody, would I draw that line every time? I mean, I might just because I've been doing it that way for so long, but I wouldn't have to. Like I'd be fine placing the mouth without that. I would still break it into thirds just real quick, but I would just make little tiny marks to just kind of figure it out. And, you know, I think it would work fine. Okay, so drawing mouths is difficult. And this one in particular, it's all in shadow, but I'm going to draw it anyway. Let me place the shadow in a little bit. All right, so kind of starting with the filtrum. <clears throat> you know, that little filtrum shape, and then figuring out how the mouth is going to sweep down this way. <clears throat> you know, you kind of get like the body of the lip, and then it kind of pulls out towards the node out here. But it's hard to tell, right? Like the node, usually there's a big shadow over it, but it's kind of merging with all that other shadow around it. But it's basically right in there, you know. And then what's tough is these three-quarter lips is now we got to figure out how much of the lip are we seeing on this side. If we're doing that, it's hard to tell. I might actually zoom in there and look a little bit. Hmm. It's a tough shape. Right, then we get the tubercle down below. Right, down around there. And then the bottom lip's kind of pressed up against here. Kind of getting this sort of shape. Sort of going back up.
question for you here. Okay. This is from Isaiah. Who ah, asks, Isaiah. Um, on a subtle scale of 1 to 10, how much would you say you exaggerate a person's features from a design standpoint? Um, on a scale of 1 to 10. It's very specific. Okay. Mm -hmm. How much do I exaggerate them? Uh, not, a, not a lot. I mean, I'm not trying to do a caricature, but there is like a design element as well, right? Because we're also not trying to do like a line-for-line a line copy. So I would rate it not very high on the exaggeration scale. I would say like a three or four. I, you can go for like... Like those Golden Age illustrators, right? Like like uh, Line Decker and Rockwell. Those guys were incredibly good. Probably some of the best artists that ever lived. And when you look at their drawings or paintings or whatever, it's clear that there's like a caricature element to what they do, right? Like they're exaggerating a lot of stuff, but they're doing it in a way where it's also very believable. And it, it works really well. So... They go for like, it seems like maybe like a 10% like caricature, right? Which isn't a lot. So out of a scale from 1 to 10, that would be like a 1 would be like 10% of that, I think. Am I doing that right? You know, so it's not a lot of exaggerating, but it's, it's enough that if you do it right, it should almost make the person look more like them than they do. And I honestly, I'm not that good at it. But if you go look at like... There's like some Rockwell books you can get that show his photo reference because he always shot like photo reference for stuff. And then I think Leindecker worked from live models mostly. But you can see Rockwell's photo reference, right? And, and when you look at it, suddenly you realize like, oh, these people don't quite look like what he's drawing. And yet they do at the same time. Like it's very clearly that person. And yet at the same time, not. It's very interesting seeing their drawings, or their their drawings versus their reference. So yeah, I mean, there's going to be a design element always. You know, and you just gotta partly experiment with your own drawings over time. Like at first, there's not going to be a lot of exaggerating because you need to like have something to kind of train yourself against. And so how closely you can get something to look like something is kind of a good way to judge that, you know, but if you're just starting out learning and saying like, well, I want to exaggerate this like 15%, there's no way to know if you got it right or not, because it's, you don't have anything to compare it to, you know, so at first you have to kind of stick more with the reference and try and get it to look like what you see. And then over time, as you get more advanced, you can kind of do more of that type of stuff and exaggerate more and and do different things like that. A little filtrum shape in there. Anyway, I hope that answers your question. I don't know. I don't know if that was the best answer. My, my real answer is I don't know. I just try to make it look good. Okay, so we got to get some nostrils some eyeballs which are going to be tricky the, what was that? Oh. Uh, I'm going to start with the nose because I feel like that's going to be a little bit easier than the eyes these are going to be tough eyes because she's kind of like looking up and off to the side and it's going to be a challenge I knew that when I picked it and I thought like ah why not do something challenging. Have some feedback and another question for you. Oh, feedback. Okay. Isaiah said yes, you answered it. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. And Brickman says, hi, Olivia and Brian. Do you know the Chinese plaster cast of David's features? They're in planes. Very cool to draw. I've never heard of that. Have you? Um... I mean, I haven't heard specifically of that cast, but cast drawing is super good. I oh, I don't have it here. I guess it's in our storage place, but I have a big cast. Oh, yeah. I, I drew, yeah, it's, I think it's Ralph Waldo Emerson. I think I drew oh. it like once. Yeah. 
problem with cats is they cost too much. You can get these like cool catalogs with all sorts of cool casts and you're like, dang, these are really cool. I could teach a whole class based on this. And then you look at the price and you're like, oh my God, I wouldn't make any money because I got to spend all the money on casts. I would ask if you have a link to that cast, I'd be really interested to see it because it didn't come up in a search just now when I looked it up. So if you have a link to it, Brickman, we would love to see it. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. I am curious. I am too. It sounds like it's an interpretation of the sculpture that's like more no. flames. You know, so it's not like just a recreation. It's, he's saying it's like in flames of the house. Oh, I see. That yeah. sounds cool. Yeah, it yeah. does sound really cool. Okay, so we got to draw these eyes. Got to get some sort of eye shape on here. Again, this is going to be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, basically, what's happening is if we have the tear duct aligned roughly here, right? Tear duct is around here. The corner of the eye, right, like the outside corner, is sitting higher than that, right? So her eyes sit at like an angle a little bit. <clears throat> and that's partly why I draw this line here. I've never seen this anywhere else. I've never, I didn't get this from a book or Watts or anything. It's just something I started doing to help judge the height of the eyes. And once I can kind of figure out how this line would relate to the tear duct, then I can look at the reference and say like, well, okay, if I drew that same line on the reference, uh, I could see that the corner of the eye, the outside corner, sits higher than the tear duct. So if this aligns our tear ducts, then the outside corner is gonna sit like up here, right? Like a little bit higher. And so then we can do the same thing over here and on this case, the tear duct starts almost about even with the nose. It's kind of like blocked by it just a little bit. And then we can come the rest of the way over and know that we have to move up a little bit here to find that outside corner of the eye. Now, maybe that's confusing. I don't know. There's probably some reason nobody else does that. But it's always helped me a lot. So maybe it'll help you too. I don't know. Maybe it'll confuse the heck out of things. That's kind of my eye alignment, you know, and then this line up here was actually the opening of the eye socket, like where the actual brow bone is, and then kind of rhythmically linking it together from side to side, and then kind of just completing that shape, how it kind of sits like in here, you know, and then the eye has to essentially fit in that space. So with her eye, we're going to have some tear duct starting down here and there's a big smudge on my laptop screen right where the eye is that's not good there we go and it's going to kind of come up and it's going to come end over here so it's going to come over and then down You know, and that's kind of how I would align all of that. And then I just get back and look at it and say, does it look too big? Does it look too small? I don't know. It's close enough right now that I'm going to keep going with it. And if you zoom in there a lot, we're kind of looking up at the upper lid. So we're seeing some of that, like, connection of the lids, kind of like right in there a little bit. And then the bottom lid swings down this direction. And tacks over the tear duct. And I'm going to say that feels a little bit large. Pull this up a little bit. But honestly, it might not be as large as it seems because what we also have to include here, now that I'm thinking about it, in fact, I might just leave it for now and change it a little bit if we need to. Because part of what's going on here is we're looking up into 
this part of the lid, right? So we're actually seeing like the bottom plane of the lid here. And then some of the tear duct up in here. Connection part of the lid, or the outer part of the lid. I don't know. And so that kind of shrinks that space quite a bit. And you got a little bit oddly shaped, right? And then we have kind of the thickness of the bottom lid, but we're not seeing a lot of it, just a little bit. So it's just going to make like a really thin thing, kind of like that. Right, and that bottom lid is going to kind of drop down this way. I have a question for you here. Okay. From Isaiah. Yeah. <clears throat> he asks, what's your take on learning techniques and methods? For example, you have a solid method for laying in a head or a structure slash figure. At yeah. what point... Sorry, the comment is covered here. Oh, at what point do you look for or explore new techniques? Uh, depends on what that technique is. Like to me, you have to learn that method well enough that it becomes completely intuitive and you don't have to think about it anymore. Oh, oh sorry. Now, now I'm to the side. Sorry about yeah, that. It's cool. Yeah, uh, you know, so you want to stick with something long enough that you can really learn it, like to the point where you don't have to think about it much anymore is kind of the key. And what you'll find is once you get to that point, then you can kind of skip a lot of those steps. You know, but it's hard to do that without practicing this over and over. And like, I always do it this way, just because I've been teaching for so long that it just kind of seems like, you know, that's how it should be done. But the truth is, like, it's not really the case. You know, there needs to be uh, or, you know, once you get more advanced, you can just draw the big shape of the head and like maybe a center line and you can just go in and add features and it shouldn't be that big of a deal. It's just a much more advanced way to work. As far as other techniques, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by other techniques. Like, say you learn to do it this way, right? Do you need to learn another way? Uh, I mean, if it works and you draw really good heads, then I would say no, probably not. Unless there's some like really specific reason that you you think you need to learn it, but I don't know. I mean, certainly you want to know it well enough that you can can uh, you know skip skip the steps and just work more intuitively. But as far as just learning a whole different technique, I don't know what the Point would be necessarily unless there's some really specific goal that you have you know like maybe you're thinking like well I want to learn to draw anime you know or I want to draw something else you know and they use slightly different proportions like they use like they kind of use a smaller third down here a longer middle third and and they'll kind of do this thing where they find like the halfway point is roughly where the eyes sit between like the top of the head and the chin and so they end up with slightly different proportions. Not a lot different, just a little bit different. You know, so like if you want to learn to draw something specific like that, then sure, you're going to have to spend some time figuring out how to do that. But aside from that, I don't know. I, it's, just, it's just personal preference, really. You know, like... If there's some, some reason you want to learn something, you should just do it. Or to just try out something different. If 
nothing wrong with that either. You know, if you've been drawn this way for a long time and you're like, man, I watched this other guy, he does all this cool stuff. And I've, you know, I've learned this to the point where, you know, it's super intuitive. Then why not go try something else? I think what you'll find, and this is what happened to me, is once you do something like this for a long time, you'll start to kind of create your own version of it. And you'll start to, I don't know, kind of start to like have opinions about things, frankly. And you'll start looking at things and saying like, you know what, I've drawn this eye this way like a million times. I think it's going to look cool like this. And then you just do it and it looks cool. You know, like the way I, I'm drawing this head right now isn't the way that I learned, right? Like I learned like much more of like the Watts Riley uh, type thing. And I learned that and I taught it for a long time. And it wasn't until I'd been doing this for a while that I started thinking like, you know what? There's like little things about this that don't entirely make sense to me. And I think I have some ideas that'll work better. And so you start kind of experimenting and trying them out and eventually it all just kind of works out. I guess eventually what happens is you kind of create your own version of this, you know, and I think it's a process that everybody has to go through to a certain extent as you really have to uh, know this so well that you start to form opinions about what it is about this that works and what it is that doesn't and then kind of adjust accordingly. But you can't do that until you've done enough of this that it, it really does become intuitive. All right, so we got some eye shapes on there. A little bit big maybe, but to be honest, I don't know why. For some reason, I have a tendency to always draw eyes a little bit large. And I've, I've come to accept that about myself. I think it comes from being into comic books for a long time, for years and years. And they always have big eyes. Not always, but a lot of them. All right, so let's drop an iris in here. All right, looking up this direction. Kind of like that. This one's looking off this direction. Kind of right in there. Something about this one that feels a little bit small compared to this. Just like overall. And I'm not entirely sure why that is. I'm just going to mess with it for a second. on there <clears throat> it's not bad it's probably good enough I'm gonna add just real quick even though her eyes are in shadow so you can't necessarily see this on both of them but I just want to know where the pupil sits inside of there and how It's right in there. On this side, it's going to be basically in shadow. We're not actually seeing this one. It's like up in here, if we could see it. It's not bad. I think that turned out okay. Gonna be a little highlight up in here. 
kind of like right up in that eye. Not bad. Let's get some eyebrow shapes on here. That might be helpful. I'm going to lighten this a little bit because those lines are like right in like where the center of the eyebrow is kind of. So I want to get a better eyebrow shape on here. Comes up that way and over this way. And kind of drops down this way a little bit. Eyebrow shapes are always tricky. You know, that one sits roughly about like that. Now, is there a design element there? Sure. I mean, I, I turn it into, I don't know, more, a more definitive shape, I guess, than kind of what I'm seeing there. going to wrap around the brow. And cut back across this way. You know, and I'm trying to be really aware of how much space are we seeing here between uh, kind of the opening of the eye socket and the eye brow. It's a little bit narrow compared to the reference right now, but I think it works. You know, like you're probably never going to get something like 100% correct. And that's pretty close. So I think that should work pretty well. Let's see. Let's zoom out and look at this whole thing here. Not bad. Let's zoom out on my reference. It's okay. It's not quite her. There's something about this area that doesn't feel quite right. See if we can do something about that. I think it has to do with the size of the chin. Make the chin a little bit smaller. And then see if we can adjust the shape of the jaw here, right? Because this kind of needs to go up a little bit, and then it kind of swings back out this way. Like I said earlier, she has a very challenging, like, jaw shape. Always had a hard time with it. Oh, it's gonna have to do. I think that's good enough. Let's get a hair shape on here as well and see if we can find What's going on with the hair? She's got a lot of hair. Hmm. Okay, so her hair for the most part rides right along her head here. Which, now that I'm looking at it, we can actually chop a little bit of this head shape off up here. It's a little bit big. Also, some little directional strokes. Like, this isn't a finished hair thing, but I want, like, a few little directional strokes here and there at this point just to kind of indicate what direction stuff is going. Okay. 
right? It's going to go around that way. And then let's find the big shape of the whole thing here. It's going to start about here, maybe. And I'm going to keep this really soft when I work on this big shape because we don't want hard edges. Well, we could have some hard edges in the hair, but they need to be really strategic. And I don't know where they're going to be at this point. So I want to keep everything nice and soft. Most of the hair is going to be pretty soft, you know, very soft shapes. Kind of runs up over this way. Sideburn area is kind of doing this. And it's kind of getting pulled back this direction. Right, because she has her hair like kind of all pulled back up into this section up here. See if we can capture that. All right, so then we get the scrunchy type thing. Up in here. That's about right. Right, this hair getting pulled up this way. So we're getting a bunch of hair kind of coming out from this direction. Right, kind of doing that. This hair is getting pulled out like this direction. And again, I'm not trying to like render hair right now. I'm just trying to figure out which ways things are going. I'm trying to just make sense of things a little bit. It's complicated hair. I mean, there's a lot going on. coming out this way kind of starts to come out this way a little bit and this is going to be like kind of that dangly piece of hair which we can decide you know you don't have to put that in but it might be good and let's see we have the rest of her hair coming kind of from behind her ear here On this way and I'm going to change this. She has her head lean forward so I'm actually going to change the direction of that neck right there. Right, hair is going to kind of connect down into there. And that leaves kind of this whole like mass of hair back here. Right, kind of comes out this way, back this way. That's my best guess right there. I don't know that we're gonna have time to get into that really, but we need to place it at least so it looks like she has hair. All 
All right, it's kind of going around that way. And then this is all just like kind of chaotic type hair. We'll worry about that later. And then <clears throat> can add these, at least this piece of hair. This one, I don't know. We can put that in, but it's going to make things a little bit challenging. Just in terms of like shadow mapping and stuff like that, which is fine. <clears throat> but for right now, I don't know if I want to do it. Also notice, <clears throat> I'm not trying to like copy this strand of hair, I'm kind of designing it a little bit, kind of like we were talking about. Can I give you some questions? Sure. Okay. So the first one here is from Brickman. And he says he just bought an anatomy app for jaw movement. Cool. I think it could be useful for your classes. Best muscle deformation animations I've seen. Sounds cool. And then the rest of the message I'm a little confused by. Oh, okay. He says, uh, word meaning cheap, anatomy standard. I'm not sure what the last part of that means. If you want to elaborate, Brickman, um, I'm confused. Uh, but yeah, he's just recommending an anatomy app. Sounds cool. We should check it out. Did you write the name of the app? Uh, maybe this is the name. Oh. Is that the, okay, like, uh, maybe Brickman put the name of the app if, uh, if you can. And then the next question is from Isaiah who asks, how many hours would you say you spend tentative, tentatively drawing tentatively drawing <laughs> a day? And are you mindfully pushing to improve or is it just the enjoyment of the process? And also is this image in the library on the website? Uh, yes, this image is in the library on the website somewhere. I've, I've never done it as a demo but, you know, when I teach a head drawing class, like I'll give you the, the photo for the demo and then I usually give like three more photos so people can practice something other than what they just watched me do. And there is a class somewhere. I don't know off the top of my head which one it is, but there is a class in there somewhere where I included that piece of reference as one of those extra pieces of reference. And then somebody drew it and turned it in, you know, as a gold level student. And then I did a critique of it. So there's like a critique drawing of this piece of reference, I think, if I remember correctly. But I've never actually demoed it before. This is actually the first time I've drawn it like this. Like, I don't know, maybe supplies and stuff. So that should answer your question. I'd have to go back and check. Like, if you really want to know, like, which class was it that had this in there, I could go in and, and, and double check. But it's in there somewhere. I forgot the rest of the question. <laughs> I forgot the rest. He says, if, or he's at, asking if you draw for, okay. Oh, that's right. If you're, how many hours would you say you're drawing per day? And are you mindfully pushing to improve or just enjoying the process? I mean, how many hours I draw per day varies a lot. <clears throat> I mean, there's some days where I take the day off and don't draw at all, you know, and that used to really hurt me a lot when I was first learning. Man, like if like I'd be taking classes at Watts and they had longer breaks back then, right? They would have 10 week terms instead of five weeks. And then they would have like four week breaks in between. And then once a year there would be like a five week break. And so I was in this weird habit where I would like work really hard and draw and take a whole bunch of classes during the term. And then as soon as it ended, I would just like stop and not draw over the break at all. And then it was really frustrating because I would come back from the break and it would be like starting over each time. It was, it was kind of lame and a little bit frustrating. And eventually I got to the point where I sort of learned my lesson and uh, 
and you know started working more over the break and was like okay i gotta actually not go completely backwards over the break uh, but to answer your question right now how much time I spend drawing during the term? A lot. I mean, I draw every day. I do at least a demo a day. And then I try to film the uh, critiques kind of on the weekends. And then partly how much I draw right now depends on how many students are in my classes. You know, that first year that we started the school, we had a lot more students and I was working and drawing all the time. I mean, I was getting like three hours of sleep every night and working all night and it was a lot right now there's not quite as many students and so i can kind of just film all the critiques on the weekend and uh you know so i'd say i spend a couple hours anywhere from like a couple hours a day up to five or six hours a day maybe well that's not true because that wouldn't include like breaks and stuff, but some of those critique videos that I do can be easily like five hours long, you know, and I would shoot all that at once in one day. But then if you include, cause like I'd have to take breaks and eat something occasionally, you know, I mean, by the time you get done, it takes all day. And uh, yeah, so it just depends. And then as far as like learning stuff, I mean, yeah, I'm still trying to learn and improve, but I'm not studying the same way I was when I was a student, right? Like I'm, I'm kind of focused more on teaching and trying to improve like my, my design sense and how I construct things. And at this point, like I've studied all the, the student stuff so much that now I'm just kind of like trying to put my own spin on it a little bit and try and figure out what makes sense to me and see if we can find ways to explain that to people if that makes sense. I'm a little bit weird. I don't know, in the sense that I don't have like a strong desire to be or to like produce finished work, if that makes sense. You know, like to me, like I like drawing like this, like this is interesting to me. And I like the construction aspects. I like the, um, I don't know, all the stuff that goes into that. I find it incredibly interesting. And unfortunately, you know, this isn't considered like finished artwork. Like I, if I wasn't teaching, I don't think I would ever get paid to do this. But fortunately, the teaching thing has worked out. And uh, I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that exactly, but that's, that's kind of where I'm at, you know, is, and I do study stuff occasionally, but not like I used to. It's not like I sit down and do like a really long study, unless I'm teaching a master study class, and then I do longer studies for the class. Uh, but it's more like, like now when I look at art, you know, like I go look at like a line decker painting, or I look at like the Vanderpool book. Now I can pick up on things when I look at those books that I could not pick up on as a student, you know, like just six or seven years ago, five years ago, you know, those books were incredibly challenging and it was, they were hard to study. And now I can look at them and be like, oh, you know what? He's kind of doing that. And then when I go do a demo, I can try and like, you know, do a little bit of that in my demo and just remember it, you know, but you got to be relatively advanced to be able to pull that off, I think, you know, and at first you have to start out actually doing intentional studies. And just looking at something for a few minutes isn't going to be enough to, to help. But yeah, I mean, for a while I was headed down the path of becoming an illustrator. You know, that was like initially when I first started, I wanted to get into comic books. And then the more I learned about art and drawing, the more I kind of realized that that probably wasn't the best fit for me because I'm not the fastest person ever. And, uh, Illustration seemed a little better, like you have kind of like slightly longer uh, deadlines and things, you need a little bit more time, you know, because you're working on like more finished type pieces rather than just trying to crank out like 20 pages of comic art of a month or whatever, or 24 pages or however many they do. And that seemed better. And then the more that I did it and the more that I taught, to be honest, it's tough because like one of the ways 
at least when I was at Watts, in fact, I don't know how true this is really, but at Watts, they always talk about how you have to learn to paint and you got to learn color and there's not any real money in drawing. Like I heard that all the time when I was there. And that was why I started to paint. I had no interest in painting until they, they told me that over and over. And eventually, you know, you kind of start thinking like, well, okay, I definitely need to make some money, so I need to learn to paint. But the problem was I didn't like painting. I, I just don't like it. I don't know why. There's something about color that I find incredibly difficult, and it's not fun. I don't know. I just I don't enjoy it. And so eventually, I, once I started teaching, I realized like, oh, you know what? I can draw the way that I want to draw and stick with all this cool fundamental stuff that I like and, uh, and try to, you know, turn that into something that maybe I could actually make a living doing. Which, you know, and again, at Watts, they were telling me all the time, they were like, you can't just be an instructor. This is something you do on the side. And, you, you know, this is like, just like a side job, just get some extra cash. And once I started teaching online and starting getting more students, I started thinking like, man, you know what? I need to turn this into a whole business, which is a lot of work, probably as much work as, as doing the comics, but it's a, at least work that I enjoy a lot more, you know, cause this is what I like doing. And I like finding interesting ways to explain things. I like finding like pretty much everything about this is like what I like to do. And so that's kind of what I tend to stick with. I think I diverged a bit from whatever the question was, but. I think we're going to answer that. We have a couple more questions. Okay. So, first off, Earthman said the name of the app is Anatomy Standard. Anatomy I don't know if that's supposed standard. to say standard, but he, yeah, standard. Sounds cool. That's what he wrote. And then he said it's really cool and cheap. So, maybe we can check that out after the stream. Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, he says about what you were talking about, um, yeah. Brickman says, I think the same in my drawings, I like to leave the construction lines yeah. and only finish some areas of the drawing and the aesthetics are more interesting that way. I think so too. And to me, like, it wasn't even just about the fact that it's more interesting. It's more that like, I don't like painting. I don't know how to explain <laughs> it. It's, it's literally just the materials themselves and the fact that like, I was incapable of painting without ending up completely covered in paint. I don't know why. And that stuff's like really toxic and bad for you. And I would get done and I'd just be like literally covered in paint. It'd be on my face and I'd be like, how did I even do this? I don't even understand how this happened. And I don't know, like nobody seemed all that concerned about the fact that they were full of heavy metals and stuff. And, and then just color in general. I don't know why. I just don't have an interest in it to be honest and so once I started hearing you know like you're never going to make money unless you learn to paint and master color then I started looking for other things other ways to monetize drawings essentially and teaching is kind of it and for that to work you got to be pretty dang good at it because you got to get a lot of people that want to sign up and learn and uh, yeah so that's just what I decided to focus on which is interesting because on the one hand you know, at Watts, they were always saying, like, oh, you got to learn to paint. You'll never make any money if you don't. There's no money in drawing. And then at the same time, they kept saying over and over, like, you got to figure out what you like to do, even if there's no market for it. Because that's, that's what Eric would always talk about, was he liked to do horror paintings, right? Like, he's like the horror guy. And now he's like the Marvel guy, but he started out the horror guy. And uh, there was no market for it when he started. And he just did it anyway. And he got incredibly good at it. And then it essentially created its own market. Like people wanted it and companies started hiring them. And like he created this whole like big market. I mean, it's not like there was no horror market, but it wasn't like it is now, I don't think. And so I, they kept saying that and I thought, well, maybe this is the thing I want to get really, really good at. And if they're right and I get really good at it, there should be a market for it somewhere, I hope. And so I just did it. I don't think that was what they expected when they kept telling me that, but... That's uh, the way it ended up. Okay, let's do some shadow mapping on this thing. Another uh, comment. Yeah. That I want to read you really quick, just to follow up on what you've been talking about. 
This is from Isaiah. Okay. Who says that makes sense and that you enjoy the deconstruction and construction and designing aspect of the project. That's a big part of it. And what's interesting is when I, like I've taught a lot of students at this point and started out as a student. And from what I've seen, most people tend towards uh, having like a natural understanding of value and color, right? And they have a really hard time with the construction and like the kind of like the three-dimensional aspects of construction. And th most people really struggle with that. And then they take more quickly to rendering and value. And then usually they take to the color more quickly as well. And for some reason, like that's just not my brain type, I guess. I don't know. It's just not the way I think. And I always had a really, I wouldn't say really easy time, but much easier time understanding like the three-dimensional construction of a head and how to represent that two-dimensionally. But then I had a much harder time with rendering and a way, way harder time with color. And I got to the point where I could do it. I mean, I did, I did some decent paintings. I did some decent illustrations uh, back in the day when I was kind of headed in that direction. It's not like I couldn't do it, but man, I had to really, really work to get to like kind of like a low level of competency with color you know it wasn't it wasn't easy and it's literally the exact opposite of what i see in most most students not all there's some that are kind of like more like me where they take to like the construction aspect more easily uh, but most of my students really are people that i shouldn't say most but a lot of people take my classes specifically because they're painters and they have a really hard time with the construction aspect, you know, but they kind of, they like the color. They're really good at color. They're really good at, at actually like painting, like the actual application of paint. But then the construction is like really hard for them, you know, so they end up taking my classes and, and I can kind of like make sense of it for them. But I don't know. It's just weird. Like you hear people all the time or like at Watts, I guess they used to always say like anybody can learn to do this stuff, right? Like it's a learned skill. And I think that's true, but there's also like certain tendencies that people have, you know, like some people are going to find color more easier than construction. You know, some people are going to find rendering and value more easy. Some people are going to find the construction more easy. It's not that you can't do the other stuff. You can. It's just hard and it's going to take a while to learn and it's not going to come as naturally as that other thing. And I think I'm proof of that, too. I mean, I figured that stuff out. I, I figured out how to paint. I, you know, I did it. I figured out rendering. I teach rendering stuff all the time. I can do it now. Renderings, you know, I'm not going to say I'm the best renderer ever, but I, I'm certainly good enough that I can teach it pretty well. Okay, I was going to take a photo of this real quick, but I don't know where my phone went. It might be out there. Okay, I'll go look for yeah. it. Sorry. How dare you? What is happening? Oh, oh nothing. I thought that was no. somebody watching us on your phone, and I was like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, they're just watching yeah. live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll go get your phone. Okay, I'm going to snap a photo of this real quick, if I can, so that I can post both this and, like, the, I don't know, whatever we do next after this. I'll probably just map it. I don't know that we're going to have time for, like, rendering a bunch of stuff. So a moth trying to fly in here. Here we go. Oh, boom. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a photo. That should be good. Sorry, you guys had to look at the weird phone glitch.
Okay, so let's see if we can take this a step further. I started kind of working out a little bit of shadow down here because I was trying to figure out if I could design this in a way that makes like an interesting ending to the drawing without having to like draw the rest of the body, you know? Or vignette, I guess, is that would be called. Yeah. Can we, just to give you kind of like a time update? Yeah. We're coming up on about an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. So if we want to stick to an hour and a half, then we have like about 15 minutes. Oh, okay. I'll work fast. We'll draw. I've never been fast, but <laughs> today's the day. <laughs> right now is the time. Yeah, if I'm ever going to be fast, this I guess should be it. Okay, let's see what's going on here. We've got some shadow up in here. Harder edge right in there. This basically just drops down here. Again, a little bit of soft edge. Just remember, when it comes to mapping, like, keep in mind that mapping is really more of, like, a training technique. You know, because people ask me all the time, they're like, man, do you have to do this, like, all the time? And the answer is no. Like, once you get more advanced, you can work however you want. And, like, when you go to, you know, like, at Watts, there were some instructors that would take the time to shadow map things. And others that didn't. And they would just just kind of draw it all at once you know draw the shadows and fill them in at the same time either way is fine like there's no right or wrong way really I like the way the shadow mapping looks and I think it's a really good like training technique you know and it's a good way to understand edges and how to vary edges and it's a good way to understand shape design and all sorts of kind of complex things. So I tend to do it. But you don't have to. And as you get more advanced, you probably want to skip it because it really just kind of adds more work a little bit in a sense. Right? Because you're kind of like having to draw these areas twice a little bit. Which doesn't bother me, but certainly if you're like a working professional, you don't have time for that. You're gonna have to move away faster. Now, that entire eye is in shadow, right? So I don't know that I need to go in there and map the whole thing necessarily. But it's going to make it a little bit tough to read without filling it in and, like, rendering it and stuff. But hopefully we can just know that that whole thing's in shadow. Same thing down here. Shadow kind of comes down this way, up here. And once again, this entire eye is in shadow. It's a good time to remove construction lines as well. And that shadow basically just stops right up here, right? So if we were going to like fill this in and actually try to render it, like we would fill in this entire space, including the eye, all of it, you know? And then I would basically just pull out that little bit of like highlight on and light on the top plane of the bottom lid kind of pull that back out and then pull that highlight back out because that's picking up light right in there and the rest of it would just have to be really carefully rendered but it would have to be really subtle up in there
Shape design is always tough. It's tough, but one of those things that, you know, someone was asking like, kind of, what am I working on learning now? And that's, that's part of it for sure. You know, because I used to stick way more with what I see in the reference when it comes to this type of stuff. And now, you know, in terms of my own drawing, I'm much more focused on like, well, how can we actually design this in a way that makes it look interesting? You know, and what are maybe like the balance of straights and curves, mixing up the edges a little bit, a number of things we can do. Right, we get this cast shadow dropping down this way. And down this way. All right, and the shadow just connects right into the lip. All right, just kind of connects right in there. The entire lip is in shadow. Uh, we're picking up shadow across this direction. So we get, I don't want to draw this on her because you have to be really careful with these rhythms. So there's Riley rhythms that I still use. Some of the Riley stuff I don't use anymore, some of it I do, but there's like this rhythm, right? And like this rhythm. And you can see as soon as I draw this in, it like ages her quite a bit. So I tend to only draw them if I really need them. But you can see those shadows are gonna run right along these rhythms, essentially. You know, so we, it helps to know them well enough that hopefully you don't have to draw them in necessarily. Basically picking up a shadow right in there. And notice that's aligning with that little rhythm that I just drew. You know, same thing here. We're going to pick up shadow kind of coming off the lip here as the lip rounds around this way. And then we get kind of like this big node shadow up here. You know, and then that's going to link into what's going on up here. So here we've got to figure out how to get this area, right? So there's another Riley rhythm that does this, right? Kind of runs right through here, which could be helpful in this case. Because so I think I'm going to use that to kind of figure out right where this shadow is going to sit and basically simplify it a little bit. You can see like it'd be really easy to get caught up in following that shadow exactly. Because if you really look at it, you're kind of like, well, it does come this way, but then it kind of goes out this way, it comes back this way, and then it wraps around this way, and I'm gonna ignore a lot of that. And I would put that more in as like subtle half tones and things later. And for right now, I would keep this relatively simple and very, very soft up in here. Super soft. All right, and then it's gonna kind of wrap across this way a little bit. <coughs> so it rolls in the shadow. <coughs> With a little bit of this maybe. I don't know. Maybe not. Again, it's you have to be so careful, right? Like the more little things like that you put in, even if you see it in the reference, it's going to age her a lot. You know, and it's just something you have to be really careful with.
Make sure it stays really nice and subtle. I'm not the so she has hair running down through here, which I ignored. But what's interesting is that hair is running kind of right where there could be a little bit of shadow on the temple here. That's just being blocked by the hair. I don't think there is. But to be honest, it looks a little bit odd without it. So it might be good to put a little bit of that in there. Or at least try it real quick and see what it looks like. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. We'll just leave it there for now and I'll come back and look at it in a minute. See if I still like it. Now, down here, things get tricky, right? Because this is all in shadow. But we're picking up a little bit of light on our lip and a little bit of light on the chin. And partly, I wasn't sure how this would turn out if I just shadow mapped it. It might not turn out all that great, to be honest. Not that I did anything wrong, necessarily, but just with the way the whole like lower half of her head goes into shadow down here, it might look a little bit odd, right? Kind of like this, how her entire eye is in shadow. So yeah, we mapped it, but it kind of looks like a little bit odd. So I guess what I'm getting at is I might have to fill it in real quick for it to actually make sense. Every now and then I hit a drawing like that. Like usually I like that shadow mapped look quite a bit. And then every now and then you draw something and it's like, oh, this actually needs to be filled in to make sense. Get a little bit of light here on her lip. Kind of like right in there where her lip's sticking out. And then we have her chin down here. And a little bit of light down on the chin. <coughs> There is no light on her ear, so that's going to be in shadow. And hmm. it's a really dark hair. Let's a quick see. question for you. Yeah. To make this moment more challenging. Okay. Give you a question to work on too. Sounds good. Um. So Brickman asks. Do you use the sculptural light, modeling tone, and conceptual light? Different names for the same thing. It is the rendering technique used by Milku, Hogarth, and Nas. Not Little Nas. Nas? <laughs> like the rapper? Nas? No. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, that goes way back, man. That was like when I was in high oh, school. Oh, that, that's a different guy. I was oh. thinking of Little oh, Nas Oh, Little Nas X. Yeah. Oh, he's, a, he's the new Nas. This is yeah. the a different NAS. It's oh. G-N-A-S-S. -S. Oh, yeah, that guy. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Anyways, all of that silliness aside, um, do you use these uh, sculptural light, modeling tone, or conceptual light? I'll be totally honest, I don't think I've heard any of those terms really? before. I don't know if I have <laughs> yeah. either, to be honest with yeah. you. Yeah, I don't know, but probably... My guess would be those are terms for things that I probably do or at least have heard of, and I just haven't heard them called by that name. Sculptural light. Modeling tone. I'm not aware of those terms myself. Yeah, I honestly, I don't know. I don't know. I'll look them up. I can look them up later and figure out exactly what that's all about.
picking up a little bit of light on the hair back here, so I want to get that in there. We're also at about 90 minutes now. Okay. And my laptop is going to die. So you're trying to tell me it's time for dinner? Um, we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm just kind of like shadow mapping the hair just a little bit, just so I have something to work with when I fill everything in. Right now, if I fill this all in and leave the hair totally blank, it's going to look really weird. So I want to get a little bit of shadow on the hair up in here. Just so I kind of tell what's going on. So you can kind of see what I'm doing, right? Is separating or finding like where the light is hitting the hair, which is kind of creating little highlights, but there's like an area of light back up in here that's picking up light. And then there's an area right in here that's picking up light. The rest of her hair is really dark. All in here, all down here is really dark. And then there's a bunch more light up here that we can worry about later. Uh, this in here is all really dark. You know, so I don't know what I'm looking at. Okay, I think that's enough. Actually, no, let's do just a little bit of this, just so this starts looking a little more, a little more hair like. Here, we've got some of that going on here and here. We need some of that here. All right, there needs to be like an element of randomness to it. And then we get the highlight cutting across here, right? And then occasionally kind of run something all the way through it that kind of links that whole thing together. And it should start looking okay, hopefully. And then what's cool is once we fill all the other areas in, this will suddenly look like hair. Doesn't look super good at this moment, but I'm going to add a couple little overlaps up in here, just to add a little bit of depth to it. Same thing around in here, right? We kind of get a little bit of an overlap over here.
some crazy stuff going on up here. It's maybe got a little too crazy. Okay, so I'm gonna snap one more photo real quick, just so we have some evidence of what's going on here. And then I will fill it in, which won't take long, and then we'll be done. And then we can cook food and eat. Okay, <clears throat> photos are complete. Now, the tricky part, I'm still not sure about this. I kind of like it like from like a form sense, but I don't know that that's really there. I guess it doesn't matter really. Either way, got to fill this stuff in. So we're going to do just top to bottom strokes like this. Put my finger on the part of the pencil that's touching the paper. Although sometimes I do that and sometimes I don't, but I would recommend it just because it's easy to break these things. You know, as soon as you start putting pressure on them, if you don't have something to counteract that, like right above it, then they break. They break very quickly. Also, her head's tilted. So normally I would say like we want to do like top, top to bottom strokes this way and kind of stack them up to create nice smooth tone. And in the shadows, we would all want all those strokes to go vertical. But every, this whole thing has a tilt like this way a little bit. So I might do it more like that. I don't know for sure that's the best decision, but I'm going to try it. So we just mimic the center line. Remember, fill in this entire eye. All right, pull some of these hard edges back out, pull that bottom lid back out, although my eraser is too soft. Ah, I made a new eraser chunk. You know, so we get some of that lower lid with some light on it. And Highlights sticking out there. Remember, our eraser is also a drawing tool. You know, that's probably why these little kneaded erasers are good, because I can shape them into like a little tiny point. I kind of pull that highlight back out. Okay, this whole section gets filled in as well. Adjusting things as we go. Yeah, it got a little bit dark. Like I said, like if you're more advanced, you can fill this in and 
and create your edges all at the same time. There's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, this is more of like a training, very methodical training technique, kind of. Okay, so you can see that makes a lot more sense once we fill it in. Uh, let's see here. Let's get maybe this little bit of lip. Now we got to fill in this whole big area here. So that's starting to look a little better. A little, a little bit messy, but... You can see what's going on pretty clearly. You know, and then like I said, it's going to look a little bit odd without filling in the hair, so we might want to do that real quick as well. Just basically just this area. Here. I'm still not sure about that. a couple little highlights on here maybe or not highlights but uh, I don't know hard edges maybe also darker line every now and then might be good but keep in mind that what I'm doing right now with like the line work is not technically a part of tonal drawing. It's really more like a design element. So if you ever 
talk to someone that's like a, a tonal purist, they will tell you this is wrong. I like the way it looks, so I do it. Notice I also left off, you know, there's like a little shadow under here and a little shadow under there. I just ignored those entirely. I don't think we need to put those in. Anyway, I think that's enough. We don't have time to render this thing. What time is it? Oh yeah, I took too long. I answered a lot of questions though. That's good. Yeah. Okay, this is the end. Hopefully, uh, that's okay. And if it's not, then it's it's still going to be the end. But I'll just be a little bit uh, I think you got a lot done. disappointed. Yeah, I was hoping I could render out this eye a little bit because I think it would look really cool and doing like the rendering in the shadow. Mm -hmm. But oh well, I'll try again next time. I'm thinking what I might do. Maybe, I don't know, you guys can let me know if this seems like a good idea. But I'm thinking I might draw one of these ahead of time do the entire drawing, maybe even map it, and then uh, start from that point uh, in the, the live stream. So you can kind of see more like a rendering type demo. If anybody's interested in that. Wait, say that again? Well, like I would draw the drawing ahead of time, right? Like the construction, all the features, uh, oh, maybe gosh. even map it, and then we would start from that point on the live stream. And then it would be more like a rendering type demo rather than like a construction type demo. Well, I was actually thinking maybe we could do like a little bonus live stream where you just continue this drawing here, you know? Like yeah, maybe could be good too. Or on yeah. Friday or something, and we could just maybe announce it in our um, community tab on the YouTube channel so people know. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? We could, because people watching now will probably want to know when. Do you want to do it Friday? Oh. I was thinking just to be the next one on next Wednesday. Oh, next Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. we could do that. Yeah, maybe we could do that and then... Uh, I don't know if it'll be the same drawing, though, because... Oh, okay, gotcha. I don't know, maybe. But I, I like that to... idea, like having a drawing that's already started and yeah, like pretty far along. because I'm not the fastest, and once I, as soon as I start answering questions that are different from what I'm working on, I slow way down. Like, I'm used to doing demos where I, I talk about the things that I'm doing yeah. specifically, and I've gotten pretty good at that. But as soon as I'm trying to draw an eye and somebody's asking me about, like, a random book, I get a little bit slower. Yeah. yeah. Well, that makes sense. And, but, yeah. Cool. I think that's a really good idea. I'll think about it. I don't want to guarantee anything, but that might be what we do next time. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, Isaiah says, uh, hard to turn off that flow state. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Uh, Kelsius says, hey guys, uh, you should draw something spooky like the 1931 Frankenstein's monster head portrait. That'd be cool. With the exaggerated lighting and the long forehead shape. That's yeah. such a cool idea. You could idea. do something like that. Yeah. Something Halloween-y. Do a Halloween-themed uh, live stream. I like that. Uh, Wayne Jones says he'd love to see the rendering demo. Okay. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, we could do that. We'll do one of these. Will be like a rendering type demo. Cool. Anyway, this is it. This is the end. Brickman says thanks, guys. Brickman, you're welcome. Thanks for watching. 
Oh my gosh, I just spit uh, on my drawing. Stephen says, uh, oh, Stephen LeBron show up. says, don't yeah. draw ahead, and that he loves seeing the process. Oh, good. I think it'd be cool to, like, do the lay-in process, and then, like, for a future stream, yeah. whether it's this drawing or not, like, do, like, a two, like, a two-parter, you know? Yeah. It'll be a cliffhanger. Yeah, to be know? continued. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that, too, because then they can see the whole process of that. Just yeah, we'll have like a week long intermission and then it'll continue. Totally. So, yeah. Yep. Anyway, that's it. That's the end. Thank you guys for watching. Appreciate it. And uh, here's the whole thing. Awesome. Thanks for all your really good questions, guys. Yeah, they are good questions. You guys always ask good questions. I feel like it's a similar group to each time now. It's like we're kind of having yeah. like a, I don't know, like seeing the same familiar people each week has been really cool. So yeah, it's good. Thanks for coming back. Cool. Anyway, goodbye.